Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in, our, in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. We give you thanks and praise today, O oh God, because you're worthy of all the praise. You're worthy of all the glory. You're worthy of all the honor. We thank you on today, Father, that you are the God of all comfort, that only you can comfort us the way that you can. Father, we thank you on today, God, for your impeccable strength, Lord, upon each and every single one of us today who have gathered, Father, to celebrate the life of your daughter, Claudette. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the life that you provided for her here on earth, how she touched many lives, Father. Father, we give you thanks and praise, God, for all of the blessings, oh God, that she was able to be to so many people. And Father, we come on today to celebrate her life. We thank you, Lord, oh God, for everything that you provided for your daughter, God. We thank you, Lord, for the strength you provided her with. We thank you how you were faithful, oh God, to protect her and to keep her, God. We thank you, God, how you dried her tears, oh God, even through her pain, oh God, and the suffering, God, that she had went through. But Father, on today in the name of Jesus, we come to celebrate her life. We come, oh God, to lift you up on today because we know that she is with you. And Father, we thank you for your comfort on today. We thank you, Lord, oh God, for strengthening the family, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for peace, oh God, within the hearts of us, your people. Father, we give you all the praise. We commit this service unto you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for dwelling here with us. Jesus, we thank you for protecting us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Scripture reading will be Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord add a blessing to the reader, the hearer, and the doer of his word. God bless you. We have loved her and we cared for her deeply and we are all mourning and grieving at this time. And from my family to you guys, I want you all to know that we're truly, truly blessed by you guys coming out today to be here with us and to support us and to show the love that you guys have shown to Claudette. Even though she have left us, she have loved you guys in the same way, so we want to thank you guys for all that you have shown her and all that you have shown the love for us. So once again, we just want to thank you and we are just blessed with you guys being here today. Thank you. Tribute to Claudette Bush from the Peace Baltimore. 
On behalf of the players, the Belize softball team, both local and national, we offer our sincere condolences to the family of Claudia Bush. Today we say goodbye to our softball teammate, but she was much more than that. Claudia was our family, our sister, our friend. She may be very private, kind, and humble, and was the kind of friend that would stand by you in time of need or whenever you need a confidant. However, when it came to softball, she was one of the most competitive, aggressive, and talented individuals to set foot on the ball, on the ball team. Claudia, as one of Belize's best softball players, represented our country in many international tournaments as a member of the Belize national softball team. As a softball player, Claudia played under the management of some of the greatest softball managers and coaches, such as Colin Hill, Charles Solis, Jules Vizana, Raymond Lashley, Gretel Lashley, and Charles Hughes. These managers and coaches, along with all her teammates, loved Claudia because she was a hard-working player and one of the toughest and most competitive softball player and catcher to ever present to represent Belize due to her hard work ethic as a player. She was many trip titles. She captured batting titles, home run tributes, most stolen bases, most RBI runs by the game, and the most pickoffs. Pick One would not dare to steal a base on Claudia. Those who tried were mostly denied. We used to say Claudia was, was a beast behind the plate. Because she would pick up the runners with ease from a squatting position. Claudia was known as one of the best catchers to ever represent Belize, and she did so in an excellent fashion in several Central American and Caribbean games, Pan American games, and even a World Series. She brought home to Belize gold, silver, and bronze medals while bringing great recognition to the country in the world of softball. As our teammate, we shared a bond with, with Claudia that one may never understand. Her passing was sudden and shocking to all her teammates. We simply could not wrap our brain around it. Claudia has gone too soon, and we have lost a true division legend. She was well loved and has gone great, done great things on earth, and we are sure she will redo, she will do much more in heaven. We will forever be grateful to have known Claudia and for her for the glorious year she shared with her as our sophomore sister and teammate. All the memories we shared will be cherished and remembered for the rest of our lives and Claudia Bush will forever live in our hearts. Love you, Claudia. Here. Okay, now at this time we have um, open remarks by friends and family. Uh, please try to keep it to two minutes.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keisha. Um, I was working at the hair salon that Cut had worked at, which was the style of your own on King and Fourth Ave. Um, she was so sweet. Every time she came into work, she would say, Good morning, Key. How you doing? Me and Derek, we here. You got something for us? And I'll just always give Derek my little snacks and stuff. You know, it was times where she had clients and she wasn't able to tend to Derek, so I would help her go get him some food. You know, little things that she wanted done. We really miss her at that shop. You know, we don't have her spirit. Like, it, it was days where everybody in the shop didn't want to be there, didn't want to go to work, didn't want to do hair. But Claudette walk in, everybody want to do hair. You start doing hair, we like, didn't you finish with a client already? Okay, come on, we gonna do somebody else too. Like, you know, it's sad that she gone. We have a lot of memories with her, but her life is still gonna live on. Thank you guys. Before we continue, someone just parked a white car in front of their delivery truck. Uh, they will let you guys to move it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is hard. Bush, born in Belize City, Belize, Central America. <coughs> On February 16, 1961. Loving parents, Norma Carr and Wellington Bush Sr. She was the second born of the children. The Norma Carr. But she also had four siblings from her dad. As a young child, you could tell that she had a mind for her own. And no one was going to push her around. She knew what she wanted to do, and no one should deter her from her goals. She was kind, caring, very supportive. She attended RCM school, then Belize Junior Secondary School number one, and finally Belize Technical College. It was during her time at Belize Junior Secondary School and Belize Technical College that she really got involved in softball and later went on to play on the Belize national team. She enjoyed and loved playing softball even though she would go home at times quite bruised up, with black eyes. But she wouldn't quit playing, even though he said, stop playing softball. As far as we 
her siblings were concerned. She was the best catcher the Belize team ever had. We were always proud of her accomplishments as a softball player and everything she did. She worked as a cosmetologist, studied and practiced doing hair, nails, and face. Her goal was to have her own salon, but she never accomplished that. But she always kept working very hard. Preceding her in death was her dad, Wellington Bush Sr. Our brother, Errol, and Russell, and her son, Leslie Jr. Claudine needs to treasure her memories, her mom, her mom, Norma, her son, Derek, four brothers, Wellington Jr., myself, Mark, and Glenn Ford. Seven sisters, Carol, Kirsten, Geraldine, Therese, Ethel, Rita, and Margaret. Several nieces and nephews, grandnieces, grandnephews, as well as a good host of other loving relatives and friends. The love, kindness, and laughter she has shared with us will never depart from her lives. She will surely be missed by all who knew her, especially my mom, her son, and the rest of the family. Thank you.
I would like to thank all of you for coming out today. We really, truly appreciate it. My sister was the kind of person that would do anything for anyone. She loved people. That's just who she was. She was a hard worker. Many, many hours she would put in working. Just getting out there and from morning till night. Those of you who really know her, was there with her know that she put her heart into everything that she does. She never would complain. She was just strong like an ox. Couldn't move her. You couldn't discourage her. That's the kind of person she was. She took her job as a, like a hobby. It wasn't even a job for her. She just go about doing what she, what she needed to do. She loved doing it. She did not start it out wanting to do hair, but she, from a child, she loved doing her hair. I remember, uh, we didn't know nothing about braids. We just say, hey, pluck me hair for me. <laughs> All of us, all the boys, girls, we all had long hair. And my mom used to do it, but I let the see him. <laughs> you know, she plucked your hair and go out, and two minutes after it started to figure out, eh, good. You got it, and she grabbed you, boy. I mean, she hold it between your legs. Can't get away. Start plotting, man, and all you could do is squirm because you can't run away. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it would be tight. <laughs> Most of you would get her hair done by me. No, tight. But you're not come out. <laughs> it lasts a long time. <laughs> you know, uh, you used to do her hair, man, and Days and weeks, we still got that. You look good. And every now and then she say, "This clear boy, look like at fix, fix up here again." And then look, yeah, <laughs> no right, no at all. <laughs> Let it go some more than the one I get later. Uh, she ain't a joke. But uh, when her, when she do her hair was neat, tidy, respectful, look good. Like I said, she was very kind and giving. But she was a no-nonsense type of person. I don't know, I think that went in our family. Um, I don't know if it was her mother's side, father's side, somebody's side. <laughs> but uh, we didn't take too much for some reason. And uh, she was like that. Uh, she was always very physically fit. You know, um, we boy, we you know we were, we were the boys were physically fit too, but my dad was just a warrior, you know, he, like they said, a beast. And uh, she enjoyed playing sports. She did not, she did not only play softball. She played um, volleyball. She played soccer. What well, we call it football? I don't know what we call it soccer here in the United States, but we call it football. And she played that. And she was very good at it. Remember at Bird's Eye, she used to play the 5 on 5 competition. And she was good. Like I said, she was a beast. But when she played that 
Being that softball, when she would come home and you would see her big old black eye like somebody beat her up. They're like, yeah, you need to stop playing softball. When you play volleyball, you don't come home bruised up like that. But she didn't care. That was her, that was her thing she wanted to do, play softball. And she was good. I think God gave her that gift, that talent. And like Glenda said, she was very competitive. Not like losing. <laughs> she would come out and when they lose, she'd come out and cry. Try to lose. <laughs> she might not tell you guys that, but she would come out. Pile out her eyes, get what I'm telling you. Oh, we lost. Well, we just lost again. She didn't care about that. She didn't look at it like we lost. We should have won. So to every time she lose, she come out, she very upset, very crying and everything else. But she was good. I got a message from one of my friends in Belize. He was more, more than a friend to us. Um, we call him Lado. His name is Leonardo. And Lado wanted me to tell you that he loves you. He loves all of us. He was like family. I remember when our house got burned down, we, me and Rita, we lived with them for a while. I lived with them for a long time because uh, Mr. Magana was my, my godfather. And so we lived with them, we were like blood. So I just wanted, he wanted me to let you guys know that. Now we're gonna get down to business. <laughs> what happens when a person dies? You know, we see a casket and a body in there. That's just a shell. Yeah, we cry. We're supposed to. Jesus Christ. Jesus cried. In John 11, verse 35, the Bible says that Jesus wept. Why was he weeping? At the death of Lazarus. That's why he was weeping. That was his friend. This is my sister. This is you guys' friends. It's okay to cry. It doesn't make you less of a person. No? But you don't want to dwell on it and let it depress you. You don't want to let it get you down and get sick. It's, it's, it's okay to mourn and grieve. It's part of life. You know, God expects that from us. That shows that you care about a person. Most of my texts I have written down, so I'm just going to read it straight from my thing, but um, I have a couple that I must read from the Bible, just to show like a context. And the first one is going to be from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Because when God created us, he put a lot of thought into it. Before he made us, he think of what he was going to do to create man. See, we were created in God's image. You guys know that? We were created in the image of God. And we were never supposed to die. Never were we supposed to die. We were not supposed to get sick. Or anything like that. But because of sin, it brought death into the world. Genesis 2, Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground. We are, that's what we are, dust. Yeah, we might dress up and put stuff on, smell good, look good, feel good, but we are dust. That's what we are. He said that it breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we became a soul. What that means is that God created a body and 
and from that body, that body was lifeless. Only my sister is lifeless. That's all the body was when God created it. And it wasn't until he breathed his breath into, into us, into our bodies, that we, we got life. That's how God created you and me. So, and, and the reverse is going to be true. If we, we're going to turn back to dust. Because that's what he says. But that's how God created you and I. Okay? From dust. So sometimes we achieve things in life and we feel like we're so high and mighty or noble or whatever. No, we're just dust. We all will die. According to the Bible, everything in this earth is going to be burned up someday. But everything that we're collecting and treasuring right now is just fuel for the fire. God declared that as a penalty for sin, man should return to the ground where he was taken. Thus thou art, and unto dust thou shalt thou return. That's verse 19 of chapter 3 of Genesis. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The spirit of every person who dies, whether righteous or wicked, returns to God at death. Now, I must say this. Most preachers or pastors, I'm not a pastor, just a lay person like you are. But I study my Bible. And nobody could tell me otherwise that the Bible tells me something. So that's what I go by. Most pastors will tell you that we have a soul inside of us. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that you are a soul. If you remember the story of Noah and the flood, how many people were saved? Eight. Eight people. You know what the Bible called them? Eight souls. That's what they were. There is not a soul within us. So when we die, what comes out of us is just the breath that God breathed into us. And that breath goes back to God because he's the one that gave it to us. I was going to read this later, but in, in, let me see. Let me see if I want to read it now or read it later. Let me see. Uh, I'll read one more text. So, but that's, that's how God made us. It is his breath that is called spirit, and that's the small s. In the Bible, you'll see spirit, small s, and spirit, capital S. The capital S is the Holy Spirit, which is God, the Holy Spirit. But the small s is the breath from God. That's his breath. And all he does when he dies, that breath just goes back to him. Simple as that. It's not like you have, it's not like any of us have anything inside of us that is immortal, no. There's only one person that's immortal, and that is God. Everybody else is mortal, that means we're subject to die. No, we could, we could die once, or we could die twice. For example, my sister died once right here. If, if we live long enough, all of us are going to be dead. <coughs> we are actually walking dead. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And all of us, unless you guys are without sin, is under the penalty of death. But Jesus Christ came and paid the penalty for us so that we don't have to be worried about guilt or any burden because we are covered under his blood. But we must accept that. We must accept him. It's like somebody coming to give you guys a million dollar check and say, here, go cash this. And you look at it, oh, it's a million dollar check and put it in your pocket and never takes it to the bank. What good is it to you? It's no good. Because you didn't 
take advantage of it and go to see if it's even good in the bank. That's what it is with salvation. That's what it is with what Christ did for us. So the penalty for sin has been paid in full. But you and I, we must accept that gift. If we don't accept that gift, then the Bible tells about the second death. <coughs> that second death is one where you will be totally consumed, you will be burned up, you won't be continually burning and burning and burning and burning forever like, like most people teach it. That's not, that's, not a, you know, that's not what God is. God is merciful, but God is just. And so he's not going to have anybody burning for a million years or whatever. No. We live a short time upon this earth. A short time upon this earth. My sister, 57 years old. Now, would, would that be a just God to have her burning millions of years? I don't think so. I wouldn't want to serve him if he would do that to my sister, to anybody else. No. For God is just. And he will, if you, if you, don't, if you choose not to give your life to, to God, then you will suffer that eternal punishment. And all that is is that you will be burned up. Nobody could put it out until your body is consumed. The Bible says, the, book, the Bible says you will turn to dust, it will be ashes. So it will be ashes, the soles, ashes under the soles of your feet. That's what you will become. So you're not going, a lot of people are afraid of, the, of death and dying and all that. The cemetery, the cemetery is one of the safest places to go. Nobody's going to bother you there because the bad people are afraid to go there. <laughs> you know, most people who think they're really bad, they're afraid to go to, to the cemetery because Oh, dead people are there, but they're sleeping. It's like, how many of you went to sleep last night? Let me see your hands who went to sleep last night. <laughs> well, you guys didn't go to sleep last night? <laughs> because that's what it is. Death is asleep. That's what Jesus says. He talks about Lazarus. He told the disciples, my friend Lazarus is sleeping, and I go to wake him up. Because he was sick, right? And uh, the disciples said, oh, Oh, but Lord, he, I mean, if he's sleeping, he's going to get well. <coughs> and Jesus said clearly, no, Lazarus is dead, but I'm going to wake him up. Why? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. If we have him, we have everything. Amen. Right? Amen. So, what is the spirit that returns to God at death? I explained that earlier before. I said to you that the spirit, small s, is what? The bread. It's the bread of God. The, the spirit, small s, is the bread of God. And the spirit, capital S, is the Holy Spirit. Holy spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so that's, that's all the spirit is. When you see spirit in the Bible, and it's small s, uh, it's just the bread of God. For example, how many of you guys came here in a car or something like that? Almost all of us came in a car, right? Yeah. Or a bus or something. Yeah. The tires that's on that car, guess what's in there? Spirit. That's what it is, yeah. When they talk about pneumatic tools, those are the tools that they use to work on tires and stuff and put here. That's what it is. That's simply all it is. So don't be afraid of dead people. They can't hurt you. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, she doesn't even know we're here. <laughs> you can say whatever you want about her. <laughs> she, she doesn't know. Doesn't know. The Bible says the dead know nothing. So, but, but we, have, we, have, we were brought up, we were raised, with this fear in us that, oh, when you're dead, I remember my, uh, I don't know if it was my grandmother now, we call her Aunt Jenny was what to us. Yeah. Well, it was a friend, but we call her Granny. She used to tell us, you know, she'd go to a Pentecostal church. I don't know how much, I, I don't know how many of you go into a Pentecostal church or so, but we used, to, we used to go with her to sit the mission. Anybody from Belize City? You guys remember sit the mission church? 
Yeah. We used to go there every Sunday. Jump up and I like that part when they get there, we jump up and oh yeah, and people pass out <laughs> and then we go in the back and we have caught a bun and, and a pool in. <laughs> you know? But she used to always I mean remember I don't know if we remember this. But she used to scare us to death. She, you know, I used to always be a mischievous child. I was bad, put it that way, I was bad. My mom would tell you I got many beatings every day, even at school. But I like fighting, so, you know, I used to always get in a fight. You look at me too, have too, too bad, you look at her, it's, it's on. So, but, she used to scare us so much, and she used to say, boy, behave yourself. Not, not, not tease people, not do this, not threat, because only people dead, they are going to haunt you. That thing scared me to death. You know, I still tease people, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh boy, if that person dies, he's going to come and scare me. You know what I mean? Or haunt me. But I'm not saying that things are not out there, because the devil is out there. Yeah. And the devil has thousands, maybe millions <coughs> of angels who are evil. And they are out there to do us harm. But each one of you, including myself, has a guardian angel. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Everywhere you go, even when you go to the dance hall, he's there. You have an angel. And there's one who records everything we do in life. He writes it down. He keeps a perfect record. He keeps a perfect record. So right now, and most of you might not be aware of it, but we're in the judgment time right now. <coughs> and everything we do, the Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. So those who are Christians, if you call yourself a Christian, you are being judged right now. I am being judged right now on the things that we do, things that we say, if we mislead people, if we do them bad things, if we do them wrong, we're being judged. But also if we do good things, God looks at that. And we also have to remember that we can always come to God and confess our sins. But you gotta be sincere. And if you're sincere, He's gonna forgive you. That's what it says in 1 John 1, verse 9. If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We gotta believe that by faith. Faith is believing in something that you can't see, but you gotta believe it. Because God's word said it. Oh, I need to read Ezekiel 37, verse 1 through 10. How much time do I have here? Do I have a specific time that I need to stop? Okay. Um, Ezekiel 37, verse 1 through 10. And this is just talking about, remember I told you that that the, the spirit is the breath and that goes back to God. I just want to show you a little snippet of what that looks like in the Ezekiel 37. And this was not going to be part of my message, but I prayed. I said, God, put your words in my mouth. What you want me to say to the people? Because a funeral is not about, a funeral is really, really not about her. A funeral is really not about her. So, um, yeah, we are memorialized, memorialized in her body, but a funeral is not about us. Yeah. We are alive. See? And we have to encourage each other. We have to look out for each other. We have to live right with the Lord. We got to make sure that our conscience is clear. So if we if we wrong somebody and we did, you know, we, and especially if they're still alive, we need to go and fix that. You know what I mean? Because God is going to hold up against you if you don't, if you don't, you guys know the, 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 um, the unpardonable sin is? The unpardonable sin is one that will not be forgiven. But the Bible says all sins will be forgiven, right? If you sin against the Holy Spirit, you won't be forgiven. But the Holy
Holy Spirit is one that's constantly telling you, John, you need to not do this, or John, you need to go do this, or John, you need to do what? Or Eustace, you know what? Boy, you need to stop the ways from doing this, or boy, you need to go do this, you need to go ask this person. That's the Holy Spirit. Your conscience is the one that the Holy Spirit speaks to. If you have an inclination to go to someone and say, you know what, I'm sorry I did you wrong, that's the Holy Spirit trying you. Uh, even, even, and everything is a gift. Even forgiveness is a gift. Even wanting to admit that you are wrong is a gift. Because by ourselves, we're selfish. We don't want to say, wow, well, I, I was wrong. We don't want to say that. You know what I mean? But all that is a gift. God has to give that to us because we are born with a selfish nature. So let me read um, 37, 1 through 10. And I'll read that from the Bible. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. But what is full of? Bones. And caused me to pass them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were dry. So there were not only many bones, but they were dry bones. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now God is talking to the writer. Can these bones live? And he said, O oh God, O oh Lord God, thou knowest, you know, Lord. Again he said to me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones. Can God talk to bones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's the only one that can actually talk to dead. Behold, I will cause bread. He will cause what? Bread. That word is spirit. To enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you. And will bring up flesh upon you. Flesh. And cover you with skin. That's why God covered us with when we committed sin. Man went and covered himself with fig. Fig leaves. God said, ah, that's not good enough. You need to put skin on you. And put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Now, you hear a noise, and you in a bunch of dry bones, I know you'll be taken off, you'll be running. But the messenger didn't, because he knew God was speaking to him, and giving him instruction on what to do. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I, when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above. But, so, what happened? But is a conjunction. Tells you it's going to join two things together, right? But, so, the dry bones now had flesh and skin and sinews, all that they had. Just like her. They had bones, she still has bones and skin and sinews and everything. But she's lifeless. Right? Same thing with this right here. Say, so, but there was no bread in them, there was no spirit. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe unto, this, unto these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. That's what it is. That's death. 
and that's actually recreation right there. So if we live a life that God is pleased with, that we have surrendered our lives to him, that he's living in and through us, we will be recreated just like these dry bones. As a matter of fact, the Bible starts about he will gather his elects from the four corners of the world. I don't know how he's going to do it because we'll be, we'll be dust. But he says he's going to do it. I believe it. Okay. Job 14, 10 through 12 and verse 21 says, But man died and wasted away. Yea, man give up the gulf and where is he? As the waters fell from the sea and the flood decayed and dried up, so man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. None of us could wake her up. This morning and every morning I put on my alarm clock. I'm a school bus driver. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning every day. Five days a week. And I put my alarm clock to wake me up at 4 o'clock. Sometimes I get up before the alarm, but the alarm clock wake me up. Do you think you could put an alarm clock there to wake her up? None of us can. So we, we think that the alarm clock is waking us up, but it's actually God that's waking us up every morning. His mercies are new every morning. So when we get up, if nothing else before, we grab our phone, come, we know we, we can't live without these things. And before, we used to live without it. We had all these numbers memorized. No, we, no not memorized. I want to call my daughter. I have to look on my phone. I have, What's her number now? I got to look for it. The only number I kind of memorize is my wife's number. All the other number I got to, I got to look. I got to look on this stupid phone to find it. They call it smartphone, but it makes us dumb. <laughs> you know? So, because we don't, we, we get so dependent upon it that our mind, our mind, our brain is not working at its optimal because we're not exercising it like we should because we're depending on this thing. If I want to know something, pull out this phone. Before we go to an encyclopedia or a library, chum, library what right here, phone. Let's notice that death is referring to be as being asleep. It says his sons come to honor him and he knew it did not, and they are brought low, but he perceived it not of them. Better move up to this. My sister is resting. Yeah, she's dead, but she's really resting. That's what she's doing. And yeah, I cry, and you know, it bothers me. And my mom and everybody else cry, it bothers us, but she's resting. Claudette is resting and sleeping right now. She is free, and this is a good part. From all worries, pain, troubles, and bills. <laughs> Not to work on no more bill. Huh? When we go to the new earth, we won't have no bills. You know? She does not know what is happening, for the Bible says that the dead know not anything. I said that earlier. I know I want to read some text. I'm just going to read this quickly. I'm not going to spend too much time on any of this. Um, I kind of like prioritize the order. I have them typed up, but I mark them numbers which way I want to go. So I'm just going to go in order and read this. Uh, Gen I read Genesis 2, 7 before. It said, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All the while, Job 27, 3, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostril. The Spirit is what again, small s? The breath. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Job 7, verse 9 and 10 says, As the cloud is consumed and vanishing away, so he that went down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. Job 14, 12 and 21, 
and I, and I put Claudette name in this, it says, so Claudette lie down and rise it not till the heavens be no more. She shall not awake and be raised out of her, out of her sleep. Her family, that's us, come to honor her. That's what we're doing right now. And the Bible says she doesn't know it. And they are brought low, but she perceiveth not. She is not aware we are here. By the way, thank you guys for praying for me right now to be able to do this. <coughs> Psalm 6 and verse 5 says, For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Psalms 115, 17 says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Psalms 146, 1 through 4 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. That's, we need to praise the Lord now while we live. Because when we die, we can't do it. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day, the very Friday afternoon when Claudette passed, her thoughts, her memories, gone. Done. The minute she passed, boom. That's it. That's all of us. Once we die, that's it. Boom. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6 says, For the living, that's you and I, know that they shall die. We are going to die eventually if we live long enough. And sometimes not even long enough where you know, even small babies are dying now because of sin in the world. But the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, Then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So you notice many texts are saying that the Spirit is a breath goes back to God. I'm going to leave these ones for now, I think. Let me see here. No, let me, let me finish this up. Let me see here. Yeah, let me finish. Now, good news. All I'm telling you so far is sounds like bad news, but there's good news. <clears throat> John 5 and 28 and 29 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves, my sister and the rest, all that are in the graves, shall hear his voice. So his voice will be able to penetrate the graves. People are burned up in the 9-11 and other places, God knows where they are. And when he speaks, they're going to come forth. That's what he did with Lazarus. You know, we have this tendency to believe that when you die, you go to heaven or hell. That's not true. The Bible doesn't teach that. If you, read, if you go home and read John 11, take the time and read John 11. It tells you when, that, when Lazarus was dead, they put him in a, they buried him, wrapped him up in grave clothes and put him in a tomb. And he was, died, he was dead for four days. <laughs> See, nobody before that has ever been resurrected after four days. They've been resurrected before three days because your body is still intact. But after the fourth day, your body started decaying, start going back to dust. And so nobody has ever been come back from that time. And so, um, God, God, brought him, God brought him back. But God did not tell him, come down. But that would not, that would not be very nice. I mean, if he's up in heaven and partying and enjoying himself and eating up the tree of life, and, and then God said, boy, come down. Right? What? Where's the Lord here? I mean, I was enjoying myself up here with Gabriel. 
bring me back into this sinful world? And if he was down in hell, God would have said, Jesus would have said, come up. And he would have said, ah, thank you, God, I place was high. Right? But no, he says, come forth. Because he was not there, he wasn't down there. He was resting. Okay? Good news, I said, right? And shall come forth there that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and there that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. More, more good news, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and through 18. But I would not have you be ignorant. God doesn't want us to be ignorant. He wants us to be aware of what's happening. Concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them will also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, because some of us will not die physical death. There are some who will, will be translated, we won't see death. But that's, they have a special relationship with Jesus. The Bible talks about that. We through alive and remain will be caught together with them in the clouds. So even the dead ones will be raised. Okay. See, my time is just about gone. It's important for us who are alive to keep that, to know that at some point in time we will also die. But we have an opportunity to surrender our life to the Lord. And we can begin that right now by first admitting that we have sinned, confess, confess it to God, and he promised that he would forgive us. And I, I, I quoted First John 1 night to you guys before, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember, God loves you. He loves me. He loves this world. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. I want you all to be saved, just as I want me and my family to be saved. I'm praying for you all. May Clyde. Rest in peace. My prayer is that God will strengthen each and every one of us, but especially my mom. Yes. This is her third. We all miss her. We miss her very much. services from Ms. Claudette Bush. As we prepare for our parting view, just a few announcements. There is going to be a repast today. The address for the repast is located on the front of your programs. Interment of Ms. Bush will be private. She will remain here at the mortuary. So as we come down to say goodbye to her, I would ask that you all be mindful to bring all of your belongings with you as we will be exiting the chapel through the doors behind me. On behalf of Mr. Ricky, on behalf of myself and Inglewood Mortuary, thank you all for being here today. And to the Bush family, thank you for allowing us to serve you at your time of